Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Thank you for coming to worship with us. We appreciate your presence here. And I uh, want to turn your attention to the Lavender, the Messenger. You can see some of the announcements coming up in, during the coming week and month. Uh, one thing to note, we're doing this baby bottle boomerang. And there's these empty baby bottles, and they're to the left uh, when you uh, go out and you can pick some up. They're just empty bottles and you fill them up with coins and you bring them back. And that um, goes towards Lutheran Family and Children's Services. And it's just a really neat way to support them and have a little fun. Do something with all that extra change that weighs down your pockets and purses. Also, um, we have Eclipse Hunger, which you know, the solar eclipse is coming on August 21st. You can't watch it directly. It'll hurt your eyes, so you need to buy special glasses. And you can get them at Walmart and places like that. Or you could bring $5 or five food items to donate to Crosslines, and you'll receive some. And Crosslines is also doing a viewing party. Um, if you'd like to watch the eclipse with other people, um, be a fun event. And so keep that in mind. The next couple weekends, uh, we'll be collecting for cross lines for that, and you can get your glasses. With that, let us pray. Good and gracious God, we come today to worship you, to celebrate your your gift of forgiveness and the good news that we have that is enough and that is plenty. Thank you for the promise and assurance that where Jesus is, there is plenty, even in our most desolate times. Amen. Let's sing.
living together in trust and hope, we proclaim our faith. We believe in one God in three persons, a triple bloom on a single stem. The God, the Father, who created the universe and is continually creating us. God, the Son, who redeemed us by coming and pitching his tent next to us. God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us and is the love that lives our life meaning. We worship one God in three and three in one. In this belief is life everlasting. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Every day of our lives, we sin against you with our actions and our inability to act, as well as our hurtful words of painful silence. We continually drop the ball. Sin has consumed our lives, and there are a lot of things we should not done, but should be doing to glorify your name. We have held back from loving you fully. We have focused on loving ourselves. And with what we have left, we have not reached out to our neighbors. Your son sacrificed and died for us. Show us your mercy, forgive our sins, refresh our hearts, and guide us through our days. We love you and want to be like you. We are thankful for your grace so that our sins do not permanently separate us from you. Amen. Receive the words of forgiveness as given to us through the power of Jesus Christ. Know now that all your sins have been forgiven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
A reading from Romans. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all God-blessed forever. Amen. And the Holy Gospel is according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Now when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw the great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and an hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. Well, they replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves. He gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over, the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Now may the peace of Christ be with you always. Please take this time to share the peace with one another. may be seated and I ask the kids to come up front here for a little children's time. Well, I've got a little dilemma. See, I got a communion wafer for us to have today, but there's too many. There's too many of you, and if I wanted to feed everybody else with this, it wouldn't work, would it? Because even if I broke it in two, well, that's two people. I could break it again, and I could maybe do little tiny pieces, and everybody get a tiny piece, but do you think you'd be full, like you wouldn't need any more food the rest of the day, you'd just be full up, and you think we'd have leftovers? No. Yeah, probably not. No, I don't think we're going to have that little miracle today, but in, Jesus, in the story about Jesus, that's what happened. Just a little bit was brought to Jesus, and he blessed it, and it was enough for everybody plus leftovers, and we do have something that kind of works that way. Not my communion way for this morning. That's, that's not going to not gonna happen. But we've got the good news. We've got a story that we can share with other people. And it makes us feel good to hear this news. And when other people hear it, they feel good. And they can pass it on. And then those people hear the good news. And it goes on and on. We can share it from one person to the next, and there's plenty, and there's leftovers. And you know what the good news is? 
Jesus loves you. God loves you. And nothing, 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 nothing can get in the way of that. That God loves you, no matter what. Nothing can get in the way of that. That's pretty good. That's pretty good news. So let's say a prayer, and you guys just repeat after me, and everybody's invited to. Oh, dear God. Your good news is a miracle to us. Teach us to tell the stories to the people around us. Teach us to live out the good news in our lives. Amen. Thanks for coming up. So what is enough? What is enough? Will there be enough? Can we afford to be generous? Is there enough? When we're afraid that there isn't enough, we tend to hold on to things hold it back, or get what we want as we can get what we want now. And when we feel like there isn't enough, we tend to not remember what we have already and the generosity we already live in. However, when we do practice gratitude for what we have, we begin to see abundance around us. It's a strange thing about this idea of enough. See, when we focus our mindset on there being not enough, all we see is not enough. I gotta hold on. But when we focus our mindset on gratitude for what we have, we find there is enough even in our most desolate times. See, where Jesus is, there is plenty, even in the wilderness. Today's gospel brings us to a point in Jesus' life when he is having a really bad day. He finds out that his cousin, best friend, mentor, John the Baptist, has been brutally murdered by beheading, and that John's disciples have buried his body, that Jesus has no way to have any sort of um, farewell, that he has no opportunity for a goodbye. Now, this is on top of having just been rejected by his hometown and his synagogue. He's been chased out of town. So I imagine from what you hear in in the little snippet of this scripture that Jesus is heartbroken, and we can all relate to that heartbreak of when we lose someone, when we feel rejected, when we're grieving. His heart is broke, and he's in pain, and he wants to be alone and have a place where he can just cry and rest and grieve. So he seeks out a desolate place. But when he arrives to this lonely place for prayer and rest, what he finds is a crowd of people in need. And he feels compassion for them. And through that power of feeling compassion for them, he proceeds to teach and to heal them and heal their sick. But soon the disciples, they're very practical people, these disciples, 
And so they begin to assess the situation. You know, they want to take care of Jesus. He, they know he's in a really, really having a bad day. So they begin to assess the situation, and what they realize is we don't have enough. So they go to Jesus, and they say, send the people away so they can go into town and eat. We don't have enough, Jesus. And Jesus says, you feed them. They don't have to leave. But all we got is five loaves and two fish. That won't feed over 10,000 people. And imagine the disciples feeling overwhelmed by their task, frustrated, stuck. That stuck feeling we get sometimes. And they are having what's called a wilderness experience. Matthew says that Jesus went into a deserted place. The Greek is eremos, and it means wilderness. It's usually translated as wilderness. And the wilderness stood for, when you see that and read that in Scripture, it's, it means deserted. It means a lonely place. It means some place that's not really inhabitable. The wilderness is a good place to grieve. It's a place to pray. It's a place to be alone. It's a place to repent. It's a lonely place, but God is not absent. Scripture is very evident of the very strong presence of God in this lonely place. A place where God calls people, gathers people, nurtures people, feeds people, instructs them. Because there are so few to no distractions in the wilderness, it can be a time of great spiritual growth and intensity. Now, when a pastor leaves, churches often feel like they are in a wilderness experience, that they're wandering a bit. Anxious questions fill the air. How long will it take to find a new pastor? Will we lose members while we're in the in-between? What if we make a mistake and call someone who damages the church? How will we adjust to a new preacher whose personality and style and, and philosophy may be very different from what we've known in our former pastor, not to mention the the constellation of differing strengths, weaknesses, and quirks. But great figures in Scripture all have had wilderness experiences. So you're not alone. You're with Moses, David, and Jesus. See, it's a necessary stage in spiritual journeying. Messiah is center stage on a spiritual journey. And sooner or later, one way or another, each one of us experiences a wilderness experience in our own personal lives. That desolate time, an uncomfortable time, there is difficulty and discomfort in the wilderness experience. Because it is a time that challenges assumptions. That is often what happens during that time. So many of us live with the assumption that if, you, if, you, if we love and obey God, then good things will happen for us. That is not supported by Scripture. <laughs> what we do know is that no matter how faithful, how true you may be, every single one of us, will experience a wilderness experience at some point or multiple times. But that does not mean God failed you. Now, it's tempting in a transition time to rush into a frenzied search for the new minister. Members become restless and begin hinting they might leave the congregation for one with more stability. And rumblings are heard 
about the sick not being visited or outreach opportunities missed. And leaders can feel pressured to make quick decisions and know they are getting the job done. But transition time is a very special opportunity to embrace God's movement and work among the congregation to strengthen, to purge, and to transform. And this can be a time entered thoughtfully, humbly, prayerfully, expectantly, and patiently. And this can be a time when we find ourselves now. Who are we now? We find our identity fitting into a far greater ministry than we can imagine because we ask the question, who are we right now with what we have now? Not, we're going to do all this when we get, but now. Avoiding the wilderness means missing out on some of God's greatest promises. For the wilderness experience is also known as an opportunity to refocus. To refocus in the wilderness can lead to focusing in on more important things. Really whittling it down and finding out during those times, those desolate times, those I wonder times, what really matters to us? to me. Truly recognizing who you are and what you have to offer. Focusing in on gratitude in the face of the fear of not enough. For God can and does provide in the wilderness, and there is ton of scriptural evidence of that one. God can and does provide in the wilderness. And in today's wilderness story, we find that where Jesus is, there is plenty. For Jesus refocuses the mindset of the crowd and the disciples, and they come with needs, and they see their present condition, and what they assess is that we don't have enough. This is impossible. But Jesus sets a table. That's what he does. He sets a table in the middle of the wilderness. For where Jesus is, there is plenty, even in the wilderness. And we are included in the invitation given to the disciples to serve and distribute and gather. And Jesus says, you feed them. And we say, we don't have enough. And Jesus says, bring me what you have. And he blesses the fish and the bread, calls the disciples to distribute this food, and all are fed with plenty for leftovers. There is enough even when there is very little, when it is offered in response to Jesus' call. And key here, in Jesus' call, the expectation is not that we know how to solve it all, that we figure it all out. Disciples figured it all out, They made a very accurate assessment. But Jesus didn't call them to do that. He calls them to bring what they have. Jesus' call is for us to show up. That's it. Show up. Bring your prayers. Bring your passions. Bring your love for Jesus. Now is the time to truly recognize what we have on hand. What's on hand right now? Open the pantry closet and look. Name the five fish, five loaves, and the two fish that Messiah has on hand right now. And then ask God, what is your dream for us? What is your dream Bless us. What is your dream? Refocus your worries of loss, your worries of making mistakes, the worries of losing what we have now, and refocus it on who you are now. So I invite you to consider 
little homework. Consider what your five loaves and two fish are as a congregation, but also in your personal life. What do I have now that I offer to Jesus for blessing and multiplication? What do you have right now on hand in the wilderness before decisions are made and feelings are settled right now? Now, I have a few thoughts. I thought I'd get you started a little. There are resources among us that could fund programs and ministries that are truly a priority. There are physical assets on this ground that can serve the people of this community and and in ways that we may not have even imagined yet. There are talented leaders among parents and grandparents and youth and elderly that can provide for faith formation of our children, of our youth, and of adults. But here's number one, I think. Start here. There is the good news. I know I've been talking about the gospel, but I did not forget that my sermon series is on Romans. (laughs) But Romans 9 is a really short 1 through 5 reading, and what it is is a transitional paragraph. Not a lot of meat to preach on, but significant enough. See, Paul has just given his theological magnum opus in chapters 5 through 8. And he uses this paragraph in the beginning of chapter 9 to transition to some other things he wants to talk about. But this transitional paragraph is a lament. In this paragraph, he shares how he has deep sorrow and how he is tormented with anguish, unceasing anguish, that he's brokenhearted, which seems really odd because he is just finished giving the good news, probably one of the greatest theological uh, uh, conclusions of the, of the good news. And he is really, really down, which just seems odd. So why is he so sad and so brokenhearted? Because his friends and his family, the people closest to him, the people he cares the most about, do not believe the good news that he has just shared. And what is the good news that he shares in chapters 5 through 8? God loves you. And nothing, 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 nothing can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. God blesses us with grace even when we don't believe it, we can't conceive it. Nothing separates us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. God loves you. And you have that good news. That is your greatest little resource that you have right now. You can begin with. It's in your hearts, it's in your congregation, and it's in your hopes and your dreams the greatest bit of enoughness that you have, and it is enough for everyone with leftovers. So trust God. Act in compassion like Jesus did. When you see needs, be compassionate. Assess your resources with an attitude of gratitude. Witness not enough transition into plenty. And even when we feel depleted, when we're in this desolate time and place and feeling we're in the wilderness experience, we can experience an opportunity to change our focus from what was or what's unknown to focusing in on what we have and what is possible. Amen.
Oh God, you are a compassionate God, a generous God. We lift up to you prayers for the church and the world and all those in need. Lord, all of us gather together to worship you in so many languages and in so many lands. Bless us as we come before you. Bless the abundance that has been given to us. Bless those who work the fields, those who furnish us with this bread and wine for our table of abundance. You are a God of compassion. We pray that just leaders be raised up leaders that would care for the poor and hungry, for nations that would assure that no one goes without food. God of all, fill those who are starving, whether they long for food or companionship. Comfort the lonely and the grieving. Heal those who are sick in body, mind, and spirit, especially Ron Fells and June Donka. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of many blessings and of abundance and enoughness, bless the feeding programs of this congregation and of this community. Be with the sandwich makers, the cookie bakers, those who stock food pantry shelves, those who point out need, whether in our community or half a world away. Thank you for these prophets, these servants, these kingdom of God workers. Bless us as we remember the saints who eat at the everlasting feast until we join them at your table of enoughness. Into your hands we lift these prayers, the prayers we've spoken, the prayers that are unspoken and in our hearts, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do so remembering Christ died, Christ risen, and Christ shall come again. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. All are welcome to share in this meal of forgiveness that has been given to you and for you. The ushers will let you know when to come forward. You may kneel or stand along the railing. You'll receive bread, and then you may either have the dark liquid, which is wine, or the light liquid, which is grape juice. There are gluten-free elements available. Just let your server know. Come, let us eat. The meal is prepared. This is a body. This is the blood broken and poured out for all of us. And in this communion, we share in His love. This is the body. This is the blood.
I invite you to please stand and receive the post-communion blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Receive the benediction. May the power of God strengthen you. May the love of Jesus Christ heal you. And may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you now and forever. Amen.